the awful sleeping death that lurks below, below the surface that kills children and grown-ups and sits there for years and years and years. So as you will hear, Heidi and Roots of Peace are still lifting landmines in Vietnam and elsewhere. And the tragedy as we sit here today is that hundreds of thousands of mines have been laid by the Russians in the Ukraine. So the people, if you like, escaping from some of the terrible scenes that have been created by bombing and told to follow particular tracks, if you like, will discover that they too have been mined by the Russians. So the humanitarian routes out are no such thing. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Roddy Gao. I founded the Asia Scotland Institute here 10 years ago for some of the members here and others to come. And we have, I think about 80 people online watching this event and others who no doubt will get here in due course. I met Heidi in London, I think probably about five years ago when she was receiving an award uh, in the House of Commons and was hugely impressed learning about what she was doing. And having a son who did two tours in Afghanistan and knowing many people who had been very seriously injured in the army, it really resonated with me what she was doing and is doing now. And today, July, uh, today the 4th of April, is World Landmine Day. So it could, it could not be a more appropriate time to have Heidi and her friends and team with us here to talk about what she's doing. The plan this evening is that Heidi will come and speak. Uh, first of all, she will be introduced by Tina, who's our board member, who is a global strategist, as you will learn. And then she'll be followed by the princess from Poland and by Daniel here, who actually at the age of 11 lost a leg in Israel. And then after the discussion that will take place, we'll do Q&A. And then as you leave, you have a chance to buy Heidi's book. Uh, and of course, as I've said, ask questions and get some answers. So Tina, that morning, do, could you come up? Thank you. Well, I've, I've traveled here from, from deepest Northwest London. Uh, to join you um, and to, to introduce the amazing constellation of, of people that we have to, to brief you, really, uh, and to raise awareness about uh, the cause of uh, landmine removal on this very auspicious day. I'm Tina Fordham. Um, I recently joined the board of Roots of Peace, the organization that Heidi Kuhn is the CEO and founder of. Um, and as I like to say, I was Heidi Jacked because Heidi is not someone who has only persuaded me. Um, it was an easy task because I know enough to know just uh, the damage that landmines can do. Um, Heidi persuades the Taliban to do things. Um, Heidi persuades the US government to do things. She persuades people who don't really want to do things to do the right thing. Um, and that is why she is such a powerful person and yet motivated, as you will see, by, by kindness and, and by love. It's a little bit unfashionable to, to say that, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, in my own work, I've, I've made a big effort to try to help business leaders, former prime ministers, um, CEOs and others connect the dots between global events happening far away and what we face in our, in our own times. And I think the war in Ukraine provides us with an opportunity uh, to, to be reminded that tragedy isn't something that happens only to uh, people very different from us in faraway places, but also people who are quite like us in nearby places, and we should act together um, for all of them. Removing landmines accelerates peace, allows refugees to return home, and allows people to uh, sustain their, their families and return to farming. And I know that you'll be as inspired uh, as I have been by hearing about Heidi's work, and we'll also hear from Princess Angelica uh, from the front lines. The, the war in Afghanistan uh, is officially over, but for the people who are living there, 
um, the consequences uh, remain. Um, so now is now is not the time to to get comfortable. Now now is the time to to act. Heidi will tell us how and why we can do that um, and what a difference we can make. Heidi Kuhn. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, fellow Scots, my family came from the United States in 1701 from old Kilpatrick, Scotland, and I cannot tell you what an honor it is to be here on the grounds of Scotland to address you on UN Landmine Awareness Day. My journey began many, many years ago. I was privileged to grow up in a place called Marin County, California, where we could hike the beaches, run through the mountains, and not have the fear of a landmine beneath our feet. When I was 30 years old, I was diagnosed with malignant cervical cancer and given last rites. And when one goes under the knife, you make a, a very special prayer to your maker. And mine was, dear God, grant me the gift of life with a one, three, and five-year-old child, and I will do something special with it. Years later, a little miracle baby happened with my same husband named Christian. And while I was holding this beautiful child in my arms in 1997, I was watching on my television screen, Princess Diana. She was walking in January through the minefields of Angola. She wasn't a princess in the material sense, but the sense of compassion that she brought to something that I never heard of being blessed to grow up in, in California. The last three weeks of her life, she walked the minefields of Bosnia Herzegovina and she told stories of little children. And as a mother of four children, it takes only eight pounds to detonate a landmine, which is the average weight of a newborn child. And when children repatriate to their homelands to, to pick flowers for their mother, a true story in the opening of my book in Bosnia Herzegovina, one little girl, boom. And what do their other two best friends do when they're 10 years old? They run to help. Boom, boom, boom. The deminers steadfastly dug to try to get them out as they were screaming for their mothers and fathers to help them. The village was holding the mothers and fathers back. They died slowly in that field in Bosnia-Herzegovina. So, when I heard of Princess Diana and the tragic death that she had 25 years ago on August 31st, it was an epiphany for me. For cancer is a landmine. None of us quite know when we're going to step on it. And landmines are a cancer to the earth. For we live in a world where there's an estimated 60 million landmines silently poised in 60 countries. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm so honored to be here at this spring, the spring where the earth still produces life. For when a, a seed is planted with sunlight, water, and a human hand, it will grow as it has for thousands of years. And whatever political landmines are in our head or in our hearts or the physical landmines in the soil, the removal of that single landmine creates fertile grounds for love. I brought you an example of what a landmine does in the world. This represents a landmine. Again, eight pounds to put into the ground and about $1,000 to take out. Now, outside this beautiful church of Canongate Kirk, there are children in Ukraine as we speak along the humanitarian corridors where landmines are deliberately laid as their mothers and, and the children desperately try to flee while their husbands are on the front line. The grass grows 
the mines grow in the, to the ground. And as you can well imagine, these are seeds of terror lurking in the earth. This is an example of what today is happening in the Ukraine, for the cluster munitions are dropping from the sky. And cluster munitions spread hundreds of shiny little bomblets. And again, as mothers are desperately trying to flee their country for safety into Poland, which you will hear much more about, they pick up the shiny envelope. A life, a limb is lost to the perils of war. I couldn't look away when I heard this. And in January of 2000, I began the millennium, the first month of the new millennium in a minefield. My wonderful husband, Gary, and my four children blessed my journey. And I traveled with the US Department of State, Office of Political Military Affairs, Weapons Removal and Abatement, to Croatia. It was shortly after the Balkan War. And in Croatia, the former Yugoslavia, 1.2 million landmines, UXOs, and cluster munitions were sown into the soil. I took a very famous and wonderful and humble vintner with me, Mienko Gurgic, who on April 1st actually true story, turned 99 years young. Mienko's heart was broken to visit his homeland, to see where the grapes had flourished, the harvest, the, the bounty, the music, the celebration of life was all riddled with landmines. So I set out on a quest to the Napa Sonoma Vintners and raised the necessary funds to remove landmines in faraway places called Dragalich, Vukovar, Ilak, Chestamale, Chestavelica, and Bashtitsa. And to see these families being able to repatriate. Families who, when I was able to come back, baked bread because they could access those areas. When I had first gone to Croatia as a mother, I saw what I thought was just a horrible sight. The children were tethered to poles like a, a very obscure merry-go-round and running and playing. And I looked at the parents when I was invited into their home and I said, why, why tie up your children to play? And they said, Mrs. Kuhn, our backyard is a minefield for if a little child kiss, kicks a soccer ball out of bounds, he may lose his life or limb to a landmine. And every time after 25 years of walking the minefields of the world, I tried to find an exit point. I would see one more child, one more family that I could make a difference for to whom much has been given, much is required. And by turning mines to vines, and replacing the scourge of landmines with bountiful vineyards and orchards, we are literally turning blood into wine killing fields into vineyards. And with respect to the Muslim culture, beautiful fresh grapes and raisins are able to flourish on former war-torn lands. And when I was a young girl, I attended the University of California at Berkeley. I majored in political economics of industrial societies. And when the war ended on April 30th, 1975, that was the peace movement. Whether our brothers or friends fought in the Vietnam War or opposed it, this was the peace movement. Since 2010, I have proudly worked in the former battlefields of Vietnam, where 80% of the land today in Quang Chi province, halfway between Ho Chi Minh City, Hanoi and, and, and uh, Saigon and Ho Chi Minh City. Um, it, it, it's just unspeakable. I went to the bedside of a little boy who called me, another little boy, who picked up what he thought was a rock to fix his bicycle while his mother visited a friend. It blew off his face and his right hand. And that story and the photo of the little boy, I promised him that I would come back and get him a prosthesis 
four months later, when I wrote, drove to this very remote village, I arrived at the hour of his memorial. It took two, four months for him to die slowly from the burns and the pain and from the inability of money to be in a proper hospital. But we need to think not only of the pain, we need to think of what we can do for redemption and to heal the earth and to make it fruitful again. In the areas beyond the mines to vines, the grapes in Croatia, we are harvesting the best black pepper in the world in Kwong Tri province. Our family has worked with the farmers to, to train over 10,000 Vietnamese farmers. And just like fine wine, the, the black pepper, which next time I come back to Scotland, I promise I will bring you some, it is different varietals. It's like uh, some wines are better than others. Some black pepper is clearly, clearly better than others. And people don't realize when you are at the dinner table and you have your salt and pepper shaker, pepper is a fruit. So we're exporting those uh, beautiful black peppers to uh, Morton and Bassett Spice Company, one of the top uh, spice companies in the United States. And we're giving the world a taste of peace, a percentage, again, a business model of those proceeds go back to the farmers and we give them dignity, the dignity to cultivate the earth without the fear of landmines beneath their plow. I continued my quest to Angola. I walked the minefields where the late Princess Diana walked in Huambo. As I was driving into this minefield, which was still there after she died, the women were carrying beautiful baskets of baby strawberries and bananas and pineapples. Yet when I stayed in my hotel room in Luanda, I looked out and here were ships coming from South Africa to feed the people of Angola. It doesn't make sense. For by clearing the land and planting a grapevine, a pomegranate tree, it is an act of peace. It is literally turning swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, so that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'll take you to Afghanistan, as there are many wonderful consul generals here representing both India and Pakistan, of which I've had the honor of visiting both of your beautiful countries. Shortly after the September 11th attacks in the United States, the world learned of Afghanistan. They learned of the Taliban. They learned of war. But I learned when I went to the University of California at Davis that Afghanistan was the garden of Central Asia and the Kabuli Wallas were these beautiful folklore uh, traders that would bring the harvest to India and through Pakistan. There were 70 varietals of grapes. Now, with again, due respect to the Muslim culture, these grapes will never be fermented but it's the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. It's, I am the vine, you are the branches. It, 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 in, in the Holy Quran, in the Bible, and, and I think just people with good hearts, the grapevine so represents, again, the seeds we have in common rather than those which separate us. Through the very generous funding of a dear friend who I did not know, other than a vintner who owned Silverado Vineyards, Diane Miller. She heard my story and knew that I was a mother of four working in the basement of my home. Now in the Silicon Valley area, there's many famous stories of men starting successful businesses in the garage. But I often like to say women have to go subterranean into the basement to start something. And I worked there for five years diligently Mrs. Miller would come and volunteer. One day she said, Heidi, please get a babysitter. I'd like to take you to lunch. Somebody's got to do this. So across from the table, as simple as she was passing a salt and pepper shaker, she pulled out her checkbook. And when you're trying to get pennies for peace, believe me, 
a six-figure check presented to you of $200,000. She said, you remind me of dad. Go to Afghanistan and turn your minds to vines. When I looked at the check, I said, Mrs. Miller, who was your father? And she humbly said, I'm Diane Disney Miller. My father was Walt Disney. It took 330 no's for him to convince the world that a mouse was going to bring joy to children. She told me and taught me, you have to accept no, but be persistent. And one day you too will be out of the basement of your home as my father got out of the, the garage. So we're bringing love and kindness to Afghanistan. And with that $200,000, I partnered with the United Nations Mine Action Service and our implementing partner, every single red cent of that $200,000 went to the Halo Trust, which is also based in Scotland. A tremendous group of brave men and women who work around the world in one of the bravest jobs I can imagine. After we demined those fields north of, of Kabul in the Shamali Plains, we had to teach the farmers for they lost the gener generational wisdom passed on from grandfather to father to son. When we arrived there, they were harvesting at midday on burlap sacks and dragging their fruit to market, hoping to get a meager profit. My husband Gary and I introduced the trellis vines, which is the wooden stakes, very popular in Napa, Sonoma County. And we did that as a demonstration plot. When we came back the next spring, they had cut them all down. We said, why? Why didn't you trust us? And I, at that moment, learned my very important American lesson. You have to listen to the people in the country. For the elders told us it was the coldest winter on record. And had they not cut those wooden trellis posts down, they would have frozen and not been able to have warm food for their children. So we had another idea, that pioneer Scottish spirit. We introduced the trellis uh, uh, cement post and, and uh, the Afghans then started making their posts out of the cement and selling them to local farmers and literally lifting the grapes off the ground, uh, pruning the vine and doubling the yield. So we went beyond grapes. Afghanistan is a country, again, 80% dependent upon agriculture for jobs. So in Helmand and Kandahar to the south, where the Pashtu, the beautiful pomegranates and, and melons are indigenous. As you move up, Afghanistan to me is shaped very much like a leaf. Uh, to Ghazni, Wardak, Logar, you see the beautiful apricots and apples and almonds. Of course, north of Kabul is uh, the Shamali Plains, just famous for the most beautiful 70 varietals of grapes, and cherries and badakhshan, and beautiful harat, where we're, we help the women who have the dexterity of their small hands to harvest the world's most delicious saffron. Over the past 20 years, as a woman CEO of an American nonprofit, working with my husband and family and dearest friends and supporters. I've had the honor of managing over $200 million under contract. We have planted over 6 million fruit trees in all 34 provinces. And when people tell me the war ended, we left nothing behind. We left those 6 million fruit trees. And right now with the spring, and nature working with us. We need a thousand golden shovels put, put into the hands of the Afghan people for the world's attention from August 15th, 2021, when the new regime took over has gone from Afghanistan completely over to deservingly so, Ukraine. Roots of Peace also excels in the export of the crops. It's not only feeding their families, but it's providing exports to new markets. I've had the privilege with my husband of traveling to Afghanistan over 75 times. And 10 years ago, 
I've met some of the most beautiful, kind people who broke their non and, and uh, you know, just would welcome me into their homes. And we took agricultural exports by bringing the traders, because nobody was going to come negotiate anything inside of Afghanistan, right, for security reasons. We brought the traders to Gulf Food. And, and they were able to taste, again, the juicy nectar of the fruit and do trade deals. And so we took the, the ag exports from 250 million in 2014, all the way up to $1.4 billion. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, a dear friend of mine with the US Department of State unofficially on this trip uh, with INL, International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. And we are, helping the farmers to make that transition from, from poppies to pomegranates. Thank you, Sally. But furthermore, it's the business of peace. For an average Afghan farmer will make about $1,000 growing wheat, about $2,000 growing poppies. And with the high value crops that are exported to new markets, three to $4,000. So we don't have to go tete a tete with the drug lords. We just are presenting the economics of peace. I have had the privilege of working with the Pakistani people and was invited by the prime minister to visit Islamabad and drive all the way to the UN, UNESCO city of Lahore. And these fresh fruits are going across contentious borders and tor torcham, torcham, I'm saying that correctly. Um, I have a little, I'm working on my Arabic, <laughs> Pashtu. Um, but the torcham border, the Waga Pass and, and getting these fresh fruits, um, not only on burlap sacks, but investing in cold storage refrigeration, teaching the farmers to sort and to pack their apples in similar sizes and branding it with Afghan fresh fruits. They're sold in India and, and the demand in India because these are no longer people begging on the streets as we think. These are, are established business people with supermarkets. And we worked with Reliance and Big Bazaar and we have brought these beautiful, beautiful fruits linking the, the Afghan people with the Indian people and with the support of Pakistan. So I would like to thank and honor the two consul generals. These are not stories we hear. We, we need to work better as a world. Now the past eight months of my life has been some of the most difficult I can even try to express. When the Taliban, the new regime, I like to call it, took over on August 15th, it was, uh, it was unbelievable. We had to get P1, P2 forms, SIVs. We worked around the clock and finally realized, my husband and I, we had to fly into the same time zone. And we flew to, uh, to Istanbul, Turkey. And for eight days in a war room, in a peace room, we never even went outside. We had room service so that we could help get as many people on that manifest list to, to be evacuated. It was heartbreaking. We did get five families out and um, I'm proud of that, but there's more to do. And I will not give up until those who were on my bus, 76, whose names were given to the Taliban, to get them safely across borders uh, so that they can continue to thrive, to live. But we have 400 Roots of Peace uh, employees that are working there right now. And again, these aren't stories that are often told. Uh, many people don't want to leave their homelands. They're content if they have, again, the dignity to cultivate their fields. There were an estimated 220 international organizations working on August 15th, only 10 remained. And I'm very proud to say Roots of Peace, thanks to INL and USAID was able to go the distance. We trained 8,000 Afghan farmers and helped them to export again with OFAC laws. We can't unfortunately go to India, Pakistan or anywhere because it's considered a terrorist country, but working within the restrictive laws of OFAC 
and with the current regime, where we were able to help uh, export across the borders within the 20, 34 provinces of Afghanistan. 97% of the people in Afghanistan today are unemployed. The world has frozen assets because of political purposes. Let us look to the spring, for there's a time to reap and a time to sow. And as the beautiful fields of the Ukraine are now littered with clustered munitions and, and landmines, unexploded ordnance, there will be no planting season in a country that produces 10% of the world's wheat, 20% of the world's corn and half of the world's sunflower oil. We have to think beyond borders for who is going to feed the world's children if we still stay in this us and them mentality. We are all daughters and sons of Abraham. And I'd like to conclude my story before introducing a very, very special person in my life who I had the honor of being invited to his bedside when he stepped on a landmine at age 11. Can you imagine? The snow had fallen and he would go into details and it covered the sign that said warning landmines. It was covered. Little boys and children run through snow because it doesn't happen very often in Israel. And together with this little boy at 11, we worked, I think I flew over 20 times back and forth, not only to Israel, but to Palestine and a bit of shuttle diplomacy and meeting with the offices of Benjamin Netanyahu and over to President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah. And each knew I was going over the fence, the wall, whatever you wanted to call it, but we needed to work together. And with Daniel's leadership as an 11 year old boy, we worked together to bring the first ever humanitarian mine action law in the state of Israel. And with funding from Spiritera Vineyards, who is also why we are here, we were able to demine the fields of Bethlehem in a Muslim village located only four miles from where Jesus Christ was born. The shepherd who had lost his arm to a landmine. I don't think of Christmas, oh little town of Bethlehem, how dare we not demine, embedded deep the landmine seep, the scourge of humankind. Yet in the darkness shineth the everlasting light, the hope through tears prevent the fears we need to lead with hope and light. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Daniel Yuval, for I have not seen him in 10 years. That little boy is a 22-year-old man and has flown here on United Nations Landmine Awareness Day to tell you his story and his call to action for a landmine-free world. Daniel Yuval. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad and excited with the opportunity to stand here in front of you and tell you my story. I was injured when I was 11 years old on February 6, 2010. It was the first time that I, had, that I had ever seen snow. My family and I drove for two hours on Saturday morning to the north of Israel for a day of fun. On the car drive, I talked with my father about landmines. He told me that there were some mines in Israel left over from past wars. I asked him what the chances would be of, of coming across one, and he told me they were very low. It seemed like the whole country had driven up to enjoy the snow. And there was a long lines of cars snaking down the highway. The police told us to go in a different direction than the mountain we were headed to because of the traffic. We stopped off, off the side of the road and went to play alongside hundreds of people. My mom stayed in the car with my two younger sisters because they were cold. And I got out with my father, brother, and sister, and we raced to the top of the hill. I got there first because I was the most competitive one. I noticed a large stone a few feet away that was covered in ice. Something told me that I had to get to that rock. 
I told my older sister to follow me. The world exploded just a step away from that stone. I lost consciousness, woke up on the other side of the rock and had no idea what was happening. I could hear my sister screaming and tried to stand up, but felt the incredible pain and fell down. My father ran to my side. He told me everything would be okay. He took his shirt off to bandage my bloody leg. He realized we had entered a minefield that had been placed there 40 years ago. He carried me and my sister to the ambulance and hesitated with every step. I was painfully aware of everything around me, but still so confused and afraid. I kept saying to myself, I'm strong, I'm brave. I felt that I needed to believe this to be able to survive and not to fall apart. I woke up from the surgery at the hospital. I understood that my leg was gone at the moment I woke up after the blast. I was aware of the situation and mostly upset that I wouldn't be able to go to the bo boxing tournament I was training for or run as fast as before my injury. My rehabilitation period was very difficult. I had to wake up every morning at 5 a.m. and start painful physical therapy. I had to learn how to walk again and I had to come to terms with my new disability. My right leg was missing below my knee and I had lost most of the calf muscle on my left leg. The first thing I told my mom was that I didn't want what happened to me will happen to anyone else. I told my parents that I want to make a difference. A few days later, Roots of Peace reached out to me. They told me that together we will, we will, we will be able to, make, to work to make a change. With the assistance of Roots of Peace and several politicians, a bill was created. Roots of Peace got me to the Israeli parliament. We reached out to Bibi Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister at the time. With the support of many politicians from different political parties, for the first time in Israeli, Israeli story, a demining bill became a law in 2011. My name is Daniel, which in Hebrew means God is my judge, and I accept that. This was my new life without questioning. I remember the story of Daniel the prophet that was saved from the lion den, and I knew that I, I am in the lion den, and I must do good deeds to save myself. I decided to set new goals and help as much as I can. This understanding motivated me to be involved in the demining campaign. Today I'm a student for psychology, and before that I served as a volunteer in the Israeli army. I would like to give a special thanks to Heidi Kuhn for inviting me to speak, supporting, and inspiring me. She has dedicated her life to raising awareness for this cause all around, all around the world. Mines have brought us to together, but they don't define who we are. There are millions of landmines hidden in the ground throughout Israel. They are being taken out slowly and painstakingly. Those weapons are dangerous and need to be cleared. There need to be fences around them so people will be safe. We never know how strong we are until we face with disaster. Reaching that lone rock in the hill has changed my life. We all have our own rocks that we are trying to reach. Some of them will empower us and others will arm us. No matter what you face, you can, always, you can always find the courage within you to rise up and enjoy the snow. Thank you. Well, thank you for those very moving presentations and the sharing of your thoughts. I don't know how many people came here this evening and what you were expecting to hear, but it's a terrifyingly poignant story. This is a chance now for you to ask some questions if you'd like to. Can, can, I, can I ask you a question though about the Taliban? Because I think people sitting in here may want to know about that. We know there's this issue with closing secondary schools for girls in certain areas. But what is the view of the Taliban of what you're doing? And are you getting any support from them? I have to be very careful how I answer that question. Um, uh, I have traveled to that region of the world, to Doha and Istanbul. And uh, the Taliban just didn't parachute down from the sky. They have been there. And the representatives that approached me have said, Mrs. Kuhn, you're feeding our children. We support your work. And there would be no way that I would be able to get those fresh fruits across 
the borders from, from Kandahar to Helmand to Zabal uh, without the, the permission, uh, the, the support of the current regime. Uh, it is too dangerous for me to personally go over there, uh, but my teams are in communication and uh, they actually have issued us written documentation uh, in support. We are also uh, with the 30 women um, who we are have not allowed to go back to work because they have to have what's called a mahram, uh, a man accompanying them at all times uh, in a taxi. They can't go by themselves. But what they have requested of Roots of Peace is that we have separate working uh, rooms that men are not allowed to work with women. Fine. We're building it right now. And once we have that, there, we have Taliban guards at the front gate. Um, they're there right now. But when they know that the hajib and uh, their heads are covered and they're going into a separate quarters, uh, we're training them. And, and they are so proud to have jobs. Um, I hope our team can uh, speak with them and, and we'll record that again without any identity of, of the women. Uh, uh, but there's a lot of concern and if there is truly going to be a Taliban 2.0, if they really are going to change. And, and um, I think that has to happen. We have to find common ground, but we also have to get those fruits into the earth to feed the people, to create that sustainable peace through agriculture. Thank you for your talk. Um, Will it help you now that the Taliban, I think, have come out against the growing of opium to switch um, to more normally acceptable agricultural produce? It's more cost effective, again, to grow alternative agricultural crops to poppies. Now, certainly in some areas, the poppies are coming back. But unless we provide those farmers with the alternative, the sapling trees, they're going to grow whatever it takes to feed their families. So again, the importance of investing in peace through agriculture and getting those licit crops into the ground. If not, other factions approach them grow poppies, you know, for the grace of God, what would I do to feed my children? So, so, um, uh, but again, this has been a very difficult, you know, day by day, just reading uh, the changes. Um, but I am so grateful to the Pakistan government. When I had that manifest list of, of um, 76 Afghans who were on this bus, we were trying to take them to the south gate of the Mead Karzai International Airport, you know, after people were falling off airplanes. You know, that happened because uh, we had worked so hard to get the approvals of the P1s, P2s, and, and, and I think the whole world was not prepared for 11 days uh, the fall of Kabul. So when well-intentioned people at the, the, in Washington, D.C. sent those forms in, finally approving them, what did the Afghans do? They sent them to their cousins and all over the country. And mm. that's why you saw the onslaught of people. And the tragedy, as I was told, the people came from these remote villages and they had heard of airplanes. You get on an airplane and you fly, you fly. They didn't know you had to get inside the plane. And when you saw those horrific pictures of the bodies falling from the sky, they didn't know you had to get inside of an airplane. So it's education at the most rudimentary level. One of the women who had worked for me, uh, very successful, Hazara woman. Now Hazara is, is uh, an ethnic minority that, is targeted uh, sometimes mostly by the Taliban. Let's just say that I don't want to add fuel to the fire, but the Hazaras have suffered a great deal. And uh, this woman in her early 20s uh, built a business, a, a dried fruit trading business. And I would meet her in Mumbai and, and Abu Dhabi and uh, actually mentored her, you know, how to, how to sell, how when these buyers are coming and how to assert yourself as a woman to show. And um, uh, I couldn't get her off the bus. They, they had the manifest list. Uh, there was chaos inside of the, hot, the, um, the airport. And the Taliban actually came on the bus 
and took everybody's detailed information. So again, I feel tremendously responsible for that. And I have continued to fight for all 76, but the woman is nine months pregnant and she couldn't get out. So I went to Washington DC, appealed to the office of the ambassador of Pakistan. And while she was turned down four times uh, for a visa, just five days ago, she made it across the Torcom Pass. She's gonna have a baby any minute. And like Mary and Joseph, we found room at the end, thanks to Pakistan. And she's texting me all the time, what hospital, where do I go? How do I do this? Maybe we can have a conversation later because this, this Scottish girl's from San Francisco and I'm not very good at advising which hospital in Islamabad. But, but you know, if we all come together as a woman and we help each other, I, I am just so proud that she is out of danger um, in having her name be known on a, on a list and, and the punishment she would have had for being a successful woman with 80 employees, uh, women employees working for her. So that Hi, Heidi, been... thank you. As uh, I'm watching the time a little bit here now, I wonder if we can just pass the mic to, um, to Tina to make a couple of observations and then we'll see if there are any more questions and then we will start to wrap up. Thank you. I, I am um, almost overwhelmed by the incredibly powerful words from these three witnesses who we're very lucky to have in our, in our presence here. And what I think is so important about what we're hearing is, is that we need not be uh, overwhelmed and feel powerless to do anything about this. Um, the reason why I feel like I can get involved and, and help contribute is that landmine removal is like a we have a particle accelerator for peace and for economic revival this is a mechanism that can take the conflict zones of the last 40 50 years 50 years with vietnam really um, and transform them so there is a, a way to to improve things when we look at the the, the countries that have been affected it's a, it's a litany of the conflicts of the last 50 years, Vietnam, Cambodia, Angola, Yugoslavia, uh, Afghanistan, and now Ukraine on our watch in our lifetimes. Um, I think that a call to action has to be what we do next. We are, we are small in number in this room, but this message is going to be um, distributed and leveraged and tweeted out, and you can tell your friends and your neighbors. Uh, donating is, is one thing that we can all do, but keeping this message of the, the mechanism of, of peace, of removing landmines, and some awareness um, of the humanity of the, of the victims, I think, is, is our responsibility as we leave this, uh, this kirk. Thank you very much. Daniel, do you want to have the last word? Or universal message for everybody in this room that no matter what we face, no matter how weak we feel, we can overcome everything. And that's why I think that from my perspective, we can do anything we, we want, including make a mind-free world. Okay, thank Daniel, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much to our distinguished panel. Thank you to the minister, Neil Gardner, for allowing us to be in this lovely kirk. Above all, thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. <laughs>